Hi, I'm Ken Burns. I've spent more than 40 years making documentary films that tell America's stories for PBS. And it really is a high point in my professional life to introduce this Next Generation Angels Students Teaching Teachers event because it's all about the power of student history documentary filmmaking, both for teachers and for students. The Next Generation Angels award-winning students on our panel today, before they were award-winning filmmakers, were great researchers, thanks to the guidance they received from their teachers and from National History Day. These students used the stuff of history as an artistic medium and crafted narratives through film that bring us closer to understanding ourselves and our country. No small feat. Our partner, the Library of Congress, is of course not just a library, but a vast treasure trove of moving image footage, sound recordings, photographs, documents, and oral histories. And it also houses the U.S. Copyright Office. Without the Library of Congress's collections, I could never have made the films I've made, and I'm eternally grateful for the help and support I've had over the years from its archivists and staff. The Copyright Office will present our student winners with copyrights today, and then the students will take questions from the teachers, which is another way the Next Generation Angels Awards honor the achievement and the promise of the next generation of historical storytellers. I'm thrilled and honored to see that history, documentary filmmaking is more important and more central to education than ever, and deeply grateful to all the innovative, dedicated teachers who took the time to be here today. Good evening, everyone. Good afternoon, or maybe it's even good morning. We don't know exactly where in the world you are, but we are so excited to have you join us. Welcome to the Next Generation Angels Award Students Teaching Teachers Forum. This program is made possible by the Better Angels Society in partnership with the Library of Congress and National History Day. My name is Lynn O'Hara and I am the Director of Programs at National History Day. On behalf of Executive Director Kathy Bourne and my NHD colleagues, I'd like to extend our sincere gratitude to Ken Burns and the Better Angels Society for making this event possible and for sponsoring the Next Generation Angels Award for the winners of our junior and senior individual documentary categories. Your partnership and support honors and celebrates the impressive work of National History Day students, the documentarians of the future. Thank you. To the teachers and educators joining us for this event, thank you for being here and for your continued dedication to your students in this most challenging year. Please add your questions to the Q&A box now, and we will answer them during the program. I'd like to welcome our six 2020 individual documentary winners. Let's start with our junior division students. First, I have Caroline Bruton. Caroline is a student at William Monroe Middle School in St. George, Virginia, and her project was on penicillin breaking bacterial barriers. Our second junior division student joining us this evening is Allison Reed. Allison attends Washburn Rural Middle School in Topeka, Kansas, and her topic, All the World Loves a Baby, Breaking the Two-Pound Barrier. Finally, our third junior division student to join us this evening is Rishi Shakib. Rishi attends Howard Middle School in Ocala, Florida, and his topic was Harvey Wiley, the man who changed America one bite at a time. We also have our three individual documentary winners joining us. Sophia Alleman from Ursuline High School in Youngstown, Ohio. Sophia's topic, FDR and REA, Bright Light and Power to Rural America. Juliana Aleva. Juliana attends Julia R. Masterman Secondary School in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And her documentary was Don't Buy Where You Can't Work, Leon Sullivan's Fight Against Job Discrimination. And finally, Summer Royal. Summer is joining us from the Iolani School in Honolulu, Hawaii. And her topic is the Tereshkova Effect, the role of propaganda in breaking barriers. Thank you to the students for taking time to join us this evening. I'm actually going to start with Allison. Um, first, I would say I loved watching these documentaries. They were really exciting. And what I like about them is they're all very, very different. Um, but Allison, I'd like to start with you. You have kind of an interesting topic that can find sideshows and premature babies. Can you tell us a little bit about what inspired you about this topic 
And how did you research a topic like this that's a little lesser known than some of the topics that your peers chose? Is that question to me? I'm sorry, I just was kicked out. Yeah, so I'm sorry. Allison, so let me repeat that. Your topic you. is really interesting because it combines sideshows and premature babies. Yeah. My question to you is what inspired you to tackle this topic and how did you tackle a topic where there's maybe it's a little lesser known and there may not be as much research to begin? Um, I was given a book by my teachers called um, Strange Case of Dr. Cooney. It's by an author named Don Raffle who researched extensively for the novel and I, it just tells his story, Martin Cooney's story, and it was so interesting to me. Um, all the different parts of it, the strangeness of it, and just the feat that he accomplished. And I guess that's what, really what it's inspired me, his heroism. A lot of students are inspired by a book that they've read. And it could be a book, sometimes it's a children's book, sometimes it's a book or an article that just catches their attention. Um, when you do research into a topic like this, you definitely run into some roadblocks. Can you tell us maybe about a roadblock that you encountered and how you may have worked around that? Um, I'd say COVID was probably the biggest roadblock for me just because um, it's really hard to have to research on your own. I mean, not I'm always doing the research myself, but just not having someone there to help you, to guide you, to give you ideas. And um, I think the way we really overcame that was constant connection with my teachers. I had to, and just learning to work on my own and um, to figure out things for myself to problem solve was really the hardest part. I think that's a challenge a lot of our students are facing, uh, not only last year, but also going into this year in many places. So mm -hmm. I think that idea of persevere, uh, persevering, excuse me, and sticking with it, and then asking questions and communicating with your teachers when you get stuck is a key idea. Um, Caroline, let me turn to you for a moment here. Uh, when I watched your documentary and read your bibliography, I was really impressed with the wide research. You pulled resources from the Library of Congress, the National Archives, the Centers for Disease Control, the Smithsonian. You had all kinds of different sources. How did this research inform your final documentary? Um, so my topic was very wide. So I thought it would definitely be important to research widely as well. Um, and doing all this research helped me find areas of my topic that I probably wouldn't have found out if I hadn't looked in certain places. Um, like if I hadn't checked the Center for Disease Control, I wouldn't have found out about penicillin's development in other countries. So um, I just feel like that really helped for my project a lot. Absolutely. Well, let me ask you one other follow-up question. You definitely have an interest in the history of science, and we know that a lot of students out there do. What kinds of suggestions would you give teachers who have students who say, you know what, I'm not crazy about history, but I love science. What kinds of things did you learn about the history of science to maybe encourage other students to look that direction? Um, with the history of science, I think it's really interesting and there can be a lot of resources. Um, but one important thing is to not get too scientific-y, I guess, because then it's supposed to be a history project. I think including science definitely makes it more interesting, but it's not supposed to be all science. So you have to really balance how much history you include and how much science you include. Absolutely. Well, at the end of the day, social studies and history is an interdisciplinary subject, right? We pull from all kinds of areas, and science is part of the story. So, okay, thank you. Let me turn things over to Juliana for a moment. Uh, Juliana, you took a different approach in that you took a local approach and a case study by a, of a gentleman named Leon Sullivan to a national movement, in this case, the civil rights movement. Can you tell us a little bit about how you found this topic? and what you learn from taking a local history approach. Uh, yeah, of course. So um, I knew I wanted to focus on something um, civil rights based, but I wanted to focus on something uh, where I live in Philadelphia because a lot of times in history, um, you don't focus as much on your local history. Um, and so I was talking to my teacher about um, different topics and she brought up um, 
the idea of the selective patronage campaign, which was started by Leon Sullivan. And then through that, I learned more about him and I wanted to um, focus on his entire life and all the things he did. Um, and yeah, I learned, um, I think taking a local topic um, is really cool because you get to form connections within your own community. And um, there are a lot of resources just like down the street that you can find. Um, so that's a really great thing about taking a local topic. What did you learn about Philadelphia, your community, the history of the city by doing this project? Um, I learned a lot. Um, there's a lot of landmarks, um, specifically Progress Plaza, which I talk about in the documentary. Um, I'd passed by it many times throughout my whole life and I had no idea um, it's like historical significance um, until I made my documentary. So that was definitely one thing that I learned. Absolutely, and I think every city, every town, every community has stories like this. It takes a little more digging to get started. Now, I wanna mention one thing before I turn things over to Summer. Teachers in the audience, we want your questions as well. You don't just want me asking the questions because I know you have questions about ways to help and inspire your students. So please go to that Q&A box. We're gonna to get to your questions in about five minutes. All right, Summer, uh, here's my question for you. Your documentary connects the space race and the feminist movement. Can you tell us a little bit about how your research led you to this connection and what you learned about the intersections of these two movements? Yes, of course. I heavily relied on contemporary magazines like Life, Time, and Look magazines, as well as the Ladies Home Journal to get a complete picture of the times. And this wasn't just focusing on feminism or the space race, this looked at both sides of the issue. And I actually thought it was really interesting to see how differently feminism was viewed during that time period by looking at these primary sources versus today. And I do think that there's a lot of intersection between the two topics, just in the fact that these magazines focus, say, on feminism, like the Ladies Home Journal, but a large portion of it is presenting information about the current space race, or vice versa, a book about the space race will be overlapping a lot with the Ladies Home Journal, talking about the role of women in the space race. And so I do think that the two topics intersect a lot. And for me personally, one of the best ways to see that cross section or that overlap was by looking at the primary sources of the magazines and as well as the advertisements of the time. Absolutely, that, that idea of looking at popular culture is really important and something sometimes students overlook when they're looking at the story because you know we think about magazines like Life or Ladies Home Journal, that's what people were reading and that's what was in Americans' living rooms at the time. Um, I also wanted to ask you, you made a choice to open and close your documentary with songs. Can you tell us the type of songs you chose and how you decided? Because, you know, any student doing a documentary on any time period can probably pick between hundreds, if not thousands of different songs. So how do you decide which ones you wanted to use and what purpose you wanted those songs to have? Yes, of course. I started the documentary with James Brown's song and that song immediately came to mind when I knew that I wanted to make a documentary about Shershkova because not only are the lyrics extremely fitting, calling this a man's world, but also the backstory behind the song. The fact that Betty Newsom composed the song and her boyfriend is taking credit for this feminist song. So I thought that was perfectly fitting. And I usually try to tie the beginning and ends of my documentary together to create sort of bookends with the beginning and end of a story. So I wanted to tie in the lyrics of the end of my documentary back to my opening scene of James Brown's song. And so some of the songs like James Brown's song immediately came to mind, whereas others, as I researched the popular songs during the era, I would look into those lyrics and see whether or not they were fitting for my documentary. And one of my favorite songs that I included was Leslie Gore's You Don't Owe Me. And that was a perfect example of the second wave of feminism. And it's bold, assertive lyrics were exactly what I was going for with my documentary. And that actually wasn't something that I even thought to include until some of the very last stages of editing. And so it, it's not like it all came together 
in one night that I knew exactly what songs I wanted to include. It was an evolving process. And one by one, I found songs that would make a complete picture. Absolutely. Thank you for saying that, because we're actually going to come back to that idea of the revision process, because I know that the documentaries that I watched are not the way your documentary started out. And I know that that revision process is so key to the NHD experience. All right, let me turn things over to Rishi. Um, I wanted to kind of transition to talk a little bit about this construction process. So you've picked your topic, you've done your research, and a lot of times students and sometimes teachers get stuck at that point. They don't know kind of how to get started. So can you talk a little bit about starting the process of creating your documentary, how you did it, and maybe what challenges you faced? So I think when you're looking at a documentary, you have to look at it as if you're writing a book because you're practically writing a historical paper and adding on pictures and videos. So um, teachers, I know it has to have all those same elements of rising action, exposition, climax. You have to have all of those things in a good documentary. And then once you identify, okay, this event is going to be my climax. These are the events that I want to say in my exposition or my rising action. These are what, this is the takeaway that I want. Then after that, you can start to develop timelines. So I do, I'll have like a notebook in which I just write out a bunch of timelines for events and then I highlight what I want. And then like, I'll do like, for example, if I was doing um, the Cold War, I would do like uh, World War II and I would do big timelines and then eventually narrow and narrow and narrow until I got to just the story. And then from there, you can um, kind of work on it and refine it until you get to a documentary that you like. Well, and that's a really good point because you often do far more research than you can fit in to your documentary or your exhibit board. And that's absolutely, that idea of making really good choices is really important as that documentary filmmaker. Um, let me ask a question. Sometimes students hit a topic like yours where there might be some moving images, but there's not going to be a whole lot, especially with topics earlier in history. How did you deal with that in your project? Uh, so the topic that I chose was during the early 19th century. So that was uh, right when film was becoming popular and everybody was starting to film things. So, but moving film wasn't as common and more so it was pictures. It was people taking lots of pictures of the White House and of government and uh, very important things. But um, if you're taking something earlier, there's a lot of, there's two ways you can take it. You can look at texts. Um, some pieces that I used in my documentary is I took a newspaper or a headline that had what I was trying to depict and I instead showed that and zoomed in or highlighted the headline that I was trying to uh, portray or I would go for you know a modern day equivalent or something symbolic if you don't oftentimes you don't get that exact picture that what you're looking for but you have you kind of just have to make do even if it's not exactly in that time period if it's not exactly in that um, exactly specifically what you're talking about, as long as it best represents that, that's the way you move forward. Well, I think that's a really good point too, because you're directing your viewers, right? You're saying, I want you to look at this headline or this quote or this image, because that's part of how you're controlling the story. Okay, thank you. Let me go on to Sophia here. When I watched your documentary, what I jotted down in my notes was the range of visual sources that you had. Uh, for a topic, you had all different kinds of images that were being used throughout your documentary. Can you talk a little bit about how you found the images and then how you decided to place them in your documentary? Um, so I found a lot of good like articles and graphs and like information from the State Library of Ohio. They had like a lot of old documents that I was able to use. And some of my favorite images that I found were the Beale, like, colorful um, poster things that he made for REA because they're just, like, very captivating and everything. And I used a lot more graphs in the beginning to, like, show, like, what the information was. And at the end, I showed a lot of pictures of houses with electricity and, like, families who were able to get electricity. Um, but yeah, I really liked those Beale photos because they're so vibrant. <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit about how you identified this collection? Because oftentimes when students can figure out a collection or a grouping, that can be like research pay dirt, especially for our documentary students. So how is it that you learned about them or found them? And what other tips might you suggest to students for finding something like that? 
Um, probably the Library of Congress web website is like my number one. And then just going to libraries and like different like websites from libraries. You can, there's like so much information. And I know a lot of people like kind of only use websites now, but like books are also very, very helpful. And that's how like a lot of kids say that they get their topics as well. So just a, a wide range of research, like wherever you can get it. <laughs> Absolutely. And looking different places, looking in different formats. A lot of libraries and research facilities and archives have been closed, but a lot of times people who work, either the archivists or the librarians or the education specialists, have been working to digitize. And that's only expanding what's available to people literally all over the world for lots of different topics. All right, we've got time for a couple teacher questions here. Uh, so I would like to start off, uh, I think this is a good one. Uh, I'm actually going to start this one off with Rishi and Caroline. And the teacher's question is, obviously you like your projects. You find these topics interesting. What would be some ways that you would encourage other students to find the fun in their topic and not just see this as another project they have to do to get a grading class? So Rishi, why don't you start and then I'll toss to Caroline. Um, I think one thing to avoid, and it's something that I see quite often, is kids often look for the topic that they want that's gonna win or that's gonna get them a good grade. And so you have to kind of look at it as what's something that interests you. So, um, you know, I was always interested in the field of science. So I looked along the lines of science books and I read a lot of books. And I know as hard as it may seem, a lot of these books are very interesting about history and historical topics. So even a Google search about, you know, interesting things that happened during this era or this era, it'll help you narrow down time periods and, you know, dates that may seem important to you. And one thing I would encourage is, um, and I'm sure my fellow uh, winners can affirm this, every time you go to a competition, there's probably 10 documentaries about the same topic of, uh, you know, like Albert Einstein or D-Day or, um, so if you're gonna tell a story that has been told, be sure to tell it in a different way or tell something that people don't really know about. Absolutely, that idea of make a twist, right? Take what people know and then kind of turn it on their heads. and. I really think you nailed it with, as a student, you've got to like the topic. If you don't like the topic and you picked it because you think it's, it's not going to be exciting to you. And that's what makes it interesting. The more you like it, the more you're going to learn. Caroline, what else would you say about encouraging students to kind of find the fun? Because this is a lot of work. We're not going to pretend that it's not. So what made it fun for you as a student? Um, I think certain ways to make it more fun are to find different ways to tell it and experiment with like different ways to tell the story. And also finding a category that you like is also really important because if you don't like making documentaries, then making a documentary isn't going to be fun for you. Absolutely, we have those five categories for a reason, right? Because we want to draw certain students are gonna be drawn to different kinds of categories. And I think one of the neat things, I love students who try different kinds of categories. Um, okay, actually, Summer, I'm gonna ask this question to you. How is it that you access these magazines that you referred to in your earlier question? Yeah, uh, yes. Um, I think that nowadays that's one of the benefits of doing a documentary as opposed to a generation ago, that these resources are so much more widely available regardless of the region you live in. So for me, I was able to purchase a lot of these periodicals on eBay or Amazon. So if you know the specific time period already that you'd like to research, you can look up what magazines or books were popular at that time and order it on Amazon or eBay. And it's a lot easier than having to go to a library like people had to do in the past where these primary sources are so readily available on the internet for purchase. I think too, I'm gonna throw one other suggestion out there. See how, if your middle school or high school has been around for a while, Oftentimes, librarians have stashes of these magazines or school newspapers or other kinds of local pop culture stashed in the back. And usually students don't want to go in that room. And if you're willing to go in and do a little digging, you'd be amazed what you could find. All right, uh, I'd like to toss the next question to Sophia and Allison. And the question is, what are some suggestions that you might give uh, for students who are taking on complicated projects of their own, 
So maybe students have gotten started and they're starting to get overwhelmed. So what advice would you give this teacher to tell his or her students? Sophia, what would you suggest? Um, I do this with like everything, not even just history day, just like making sure like, you know, like every, like everything you have to do, like all the work you have to do. And like, I make lists or outlines and like go by step by step, because if you look at just making a 10 minute documentary at like the state level or something, it can be very overwhelming because there's audio and the video and your like biography and everything. Um, but just taking it one step at a time. And I do agree, probably the like most important part of all of this is your topic because it has to be interesting and you have to like love learning about it because you're gonna be learning about it for ever. <laughs> you learn so much and you have to like be passionate about it. Absolutely. Allison, what else would you say for a student who might be getting overwhelmed or maybe thinking about quitting this darn project at this point of the year? I would recommend um, stop trying to fo stop focusing on including every detail of the topic or trying to make a very um, detailed summary of the topic. Give a summary of the topic and then focus on how that topic broke barriers. That was our theme, but or this year communication in history, I think focus on the theme. See how your topic fits the theme because that's what history day is about. How does your topic relate to this theme, but it's all you do have to include some details in some summary, but you don't need to include every detail or every interesting fact about your topic. Just prove that it um, fits the theme and it, that it fits the theme well. Absolutely. That's a really good point because we want to hear about your argument, less about what the facts are that I could read by reading an encyclopedia about your topic. All right, Juliana, I want to toss a question to you here. Uh, what are some places that you helped to find stock footage, whether that be stills or video, to work on your project? What are some places that you found success in being able to get started? Um, yeah, so I use a lot of different places. Um, sometimes I just use Google, Google Images. Um, for a lot of, you can find a lot of great images there. Um, and then for videos, there's a lot of um, smaller types of like documentaries and less known um, videos that are on YouTube. Um, and I used um, clips from those uh, videos on YouTube. I also um, accessed pictures from um, online archives, specifically um, one that was local to me, the Temple University. They have online archives and that's where I got a lot of pictures from. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of different places that I got images from and other students can too. Excellent. Thank you. Teachers, I'm going to have you keep those questions coming, but I'm going to pause for a moment and turn things over to George Taroni from the Copyright Office at the Library of Congress. So George, thank you for joining us this evening. Thank you very much, Lynn. And congratulations to all of you for winning such uh, prestigious awards. But I'd also like to congratulate you on being official owners of copyrights. And um, so I'm going to take the next few minutes to explain what that means and uh, talk about how copyright works for both creators and users of creative works and how it promotes creativity in our country. You've seen the C in the circle, right? You see it in books and movies and other places, and you probably have a, some of, uh, of an idea. Maybe you're experts, I don't know. Um, but I'll tell you a little bit about it. Uh, copyright has been really important in the foundation of our country since the very beginning. If you look at the Constitution all the way back, Article 1, Section 8, Clause 8, it talks about uh, Congress being able to pass laws to promote the uh, useful arts and sciences by giving uh, uh, exclusive rights uh, to, to authors uh, of their writings. And um, so in 1790, in the very first Congress, signed by George Washington himself, uh, Congress passed the first copyright law. This is what it looked like. It was two pages. This isn't the real thing. The real one's in the archives. <laughs> but this is what it looked like. And uh, so it was two pages and it covered uh, the rights for maps, charts, and books and protected those rights for a period of 14 years. 
And ever since 1790, all the way up until the present, uh, the copyright law has been expanded to add more rights and, and add more uh, features, shall we say, to the law. And right now, the copyright law is 424 pages of very interesting reading. This is the copyright law of the United States. But guess what? I'm going to summarize it in about two minutes for you. So you don't have to read the 424 pages, but you're welcome to if you want to. Uh, and why is this important? Why do we keep um, revising the law and making it something really important for our country? Well, the reason is that the copyright core industries, things covered by copyright, that means books and movies and, and music and pictures, that represents $1.3 trillion of our economy every year, of our gross domestic product. So that's a big industry. And the copyright law now protects things that didn't even exist in 1790. Motion pictures, of course, being a good example of that. Sound recordings, things like that that didn't exist then are now covered. Uh, video games, computer programs, all kinds of things are covered by copyright law. And so when we talk about copyright, it's actually uh, a bunch of rights. It's a bundle of rights. And the Constitution mentioned something about exclusive rights. So the copyright owner, in your case, you, people who have uh, created these movies, uh, have some exclusive rights. You have the right to reproduce the work, to make a copy or many copies, to distribute the work in whatever way you'd like, uh, to make derivative works uh, for people who make movies. A real good example of that is someone writing a screenplay and then making a movie out of it. That's called a derivative work. Um, also the right to perform or display the work and to create digital copies and audio form and for visual arts to uh, have proper attribution and uh, preserving the integrity of those works. So those are a bunch of rights. And uh, when you get an idea, you had the idea for your movies, right? And then you started to put together, as soon as you fix that idea in a tangible form, you own the copyright. Now, back in 1790, fixing something in a tangible form meant getting out a quill pen and writing it down or drawing a picture or using a printing press perhaps. But nowadays, a tangible form means saving it on your iPhone or on a flash drive or in the cloud that is fixed. And from that moment on, you own the copyright. And copyright is an intellectual property. And because it's a property, it's something uh, like a car, like a house, a refrigerator. You can do things with it, you own it, and you can sell it or lease it or transfer it to somewhere, someone else, either all of those rights or individual rights. So um, a movie maker, for example, may uh, sell or transfer the rights to their work to, um, to a production house and get the movie made, you can also use it as a collateral. So when um, somebody goes, a producer goes to make their next movie, they may go to a bank and use the copyrights from their previous blockbuster hit as a collateral to get a loan for their next movie production because it's worth a lot. And um, that's why copyright is so important to our, um, to our nation's economy. And that's how it promotes creativity. So that gets back to the constitution of, of promoting this progress by, by giving people incentives to keep on being creative, to make movies, to write songs, to write books, um, to take photographs, and also to be responsible users of other people's works, right? So, you have your rights and other people have their exclusive rights uh, and everyone is respecting one another. Well, of course, life isn't perfect. And uh, so there are provisions in the law that give you protections. Uh, and one of them is obtained by registering your copy. 
to write. And what that means I'm sorry, it is that you are creating a public record. Where it can be big money. George, I'm sorry. This is Lynn. I think that we're having some audio issues. Can you say that last sentence again, please? Okay. I I was out. Am I back? Now you're back. Okay. All right. I don't know. Well, anyway, here we go. Uh, so yes, you can go to court and um, and get um, get statutory damages for that. So registering your copyright is part of the business of the Library of Congress and has been since 1870. This is our 150th year, our anniversary year. We're celebrating that. And um, this is a really important part of what we do and what the library does. It also has a provision where, where the Library of Congress gets copies of works that are published in the, in the United States that helps build the library collections and it creates a mint record of American creativity. So it's all really important. And this is what we do at the US Copyright Office, um, among other things. Uh, we, so we register about a half a million uh, copyright registrations per year. We answer public inquiries. You'll want to look at our website, copyright.gov. And um, so it's a very important part of our work and we're thrilled to be able to help promote creativity in that way. And so on behalf of Shira Perlmutter, she's our new 14th Register of Copyright. She just started yesterday, in fact. Um, she is the person responsible for uh, maintaining this authoritative record. And so on her behalf, I'm presenting to you virtually your certificates of registration for copyright. You'll get these uh, by old fashioned mail. But this is what it looks like. It says, this is to certify that on July 15th, 2020, a claim to copyright, a work identified as, and then we have the title of the work, was registered under number, so and so, you each get a number, registration number. This work was registered in accordance with provisions of the United States Copyright Law, Title 17, United States Code. And this is to certify further that the attached is an, an additional certificate for this work in witness whereof the seal of this office is affixed here too on October 20th, 2020. This was signed by our acting register of copyrights, Maria Strong, and uh, is your official registration of copyright. So congratulations to you. Um, I'm thrilled that you have created such wonderful works and that you are part of the copyright ecosystem of the United States and that you are contributing your creativity to the American experience. Um, one of the things that I is, um, is connecting all people to the library. That is our vision. And one of the people who does that best is our director of educational outreach, Leanne, Leanne Potter. And um, so I'm going to hand it over to her now, and uh, she'll talk to you more about the library. So thank you. Thanks so much, George. Um, I just I wish so much the kids were in person to meet you because your whole demeanor about copyright is just so refreshing. I think there's a tendency for us to, you know, get nervous about copyright because we don't want to violate copyright. And of course we don't. But when you talk about intellectual property and you remind young people that that's exactly what they all have and how important it is that they embrace their intellectual property and choose to register copyright. I just think it's wonderful. So um, congratulations to all of you young people and a big congratulations to all of your teachers as well. And I'm really a big fan of all of the teachers who are on this call. 
I am. Um, I'm also feeling a little emboldened because, you know, George had a couple of certificates that he wanted to show you. And I know Lynn is laughing because she knows what I'm about to do, but I'm going to do it anyway. Um, so as George said, I work at the Library of Congress, but once upon a time, about 30 some odd years ago, I was also a National History Day participant. And my National History Day teacher, Mr. Gary Gibbons in Colorado, is still a very dear friend of mine, and we send Christmas cards to each other every year. But I went up into my home archives earlier today and pulled out my old scrapbook that literally is falling apart so that I could show you all my, um, my certificate of achievement from National History Day in 1982 um, as a way of saying, you guys really have no idea what sort of a journey you are embarking on as young researchers. And I really sincerely hope that your energy and enthusiasm for history and for doing original research stays with you for your life, for your lifetime. Um, it will serve you well. Um, I tell you what, Courtney, if you wanna go ahead and pull my slides up, what I was gonna spend a few minutes doing was highlighting some of the resources of the Library of Congress so that the teachers that are on the call as well as the other students um, who may or may not be as familiar as you all clearly are um, with the library and its collections might learn a little bit more. So Courtney, let's go on to the next slide. If we were um, in the Washington, this is what I wanted to do was give you a sense of place. I think there is a tendency these days to forget in the virtual world that we're living in that these places exist in the physical. And so what I've got on the big screen is Capitol Hill. And from this vantage point, we're on the east side of the Capitol building. We're looking west and I've got three buildings circled. And those are the three buildings on Capitol Hill that are all part of the Library of Congress. So when you access the collections of the library, you are accessing original materials that are in one of those three buildings or are at a facility out in Culpeper, Virginia, which is where we keep the motion picture and sound recordings of the library, or perhaps at one of the storage facilities near Fort Meade, Maryland, near the Baltimore Washington International Airport. But chances are good for you guys and your projects, the materials that you accessed really do live in one of these three buildings on Capitol Hill. You can go to the next slide. And if we were in Washington, this is what we would be showing you guys. So I sincerely hope that you will make it to Washington one day and you will let us know that you are there so that we can show you around the library. On the left hand side of the screen is the main reading room and on the right hand side of the screen is what we call the Great Hall and it is truly a palace to knowledge and creativity. And when this building, the Jefferson building opened in 1897, it was referred to as the most beautiful building in all of America. And I would say it is. And I would also say that it should be. This is our nation's library. This is where American knowledge and creativity lives and it absolutely should be a beautiful building. All right, how about the next, the next? Um, I'm glad that, that George mentioned how many um, copyright registrations there are every year. This slide, I have no intention of reading it all to you, but I want you to know that the Library of Congress is the largest library in the world. It was established in 1800, it holds the US Copyright Office, and it literally holds hundreds of millions of objects in a wide variety of media. And I know many of you know this because you've explored the library's website, um, but the variety of media is significant when you're doing research. Keeping in mind that information comes from a wide variety of sources, sometimes it's the sources themselves that inspire our student interests. Courtney, let's go on to the next one. And of course, you can access so much of the library's collections through loc.gov. And when I say so much, it's true. There are literally millions of digitized objects available through the library's website. And you can see, you know, from the drop down screen there, you can access audio recordings as well as books and printed materials and films and video and legislation, manuscripts, maps, notated music, and so on. And again, you can access millions of things, but 
And I was so glad to hear that many of you, I think it was Juliana in particular, mentioned using local resources. The library's collections absolutely reflect our national experience as well as our place in international experience. And there's nothing quite like being able to access local resources as well. And sometimes the Library of Congress's collections are a terrific point of entry into those more local resources. Um, let's go to the next slide. So I did a little poking around after I watched your your films. And part of the fun for me was thinking about, you know, I wonder the extent to which our student winners have already explored the library's website and made use of it. And so obviously I was really tickled um, and assumed Caroline had spent plenty of time on the library's website because when I started looking into penicillin, wow, it was fun for me because I was like, hey, I think she used that photograph or wow, that's cool. I love the way she did that with that photograph or with that other image. Um, Courtney, how about the next one? And likewise, um, with Rishi, I found, um, you know, I didn't know who Dr. Harvey Wiley was. And I was a little embarrassed by that because when I, wa when I saw your film, um, of course I know about the Food and Drug Administration and how thankful I am that we have an FDA in this country. Um, but I had no idea that, um, that the role that this chemist played. So thank you for that. I loved learning more about him and I really got a kick out of exploring as well what the library's collections had related to him. Courtney going, yeah, I was gonna say, and then of course the, the last one, Sophia, the one that I looked at next, um, when I did a search on the Rural Electrification Administration, of course, my first thought was, and I kind of think he might be on the call, a colleague of mine who, um, Jeff Urban, he works at the Franklin Roosevelt Library up in Hyde Park, New York. And I assumed that you probably spent a lot of time on the FDR Library's website. So I wasn't quite sure I'd find as much on the Library of Congress's site, but then I saw the images of these posters. And when I saw your, your film and I saw how you incorporated them, I thought, oh, she did exactly what I would do. These images are great. And then it's so funny that you've mentioned them specifically just now and acknowledged that they were also available to you through a facility in Ohio. And I loved hearing that because again, I think sometimes there's this, this assumption that, well, you know, if it's not one place, then it doesn't exist at all. When in fact, that's not the case. You know, it, we may have a couple of examples, but another facility may actually be a better resource for you when you're doing your research. Okay, we'll keep going, next one. So next year's theme, and I'm, of course I'm wrapping up in terms of, because I know my time is short. Um, Last year's theme was breaking barriers and you all did amazing projects. And this year with the theme being communication in history, um, I was just you know, doing a little bit of brainstorming. I'm sure that the teachers that are on the phone are on the call. I'm sure that you have all done this with your students or you will be doing this sort of thing with your students. And that is you know, thinking about a topic like this, can, as with every History Day topic, you can go in a million different directions. You can think about, you know, the different kinds of communication, the different needs for communication, the different formats, the different modes, the, and so on and so on and so on. And that's a great place to start research. You know, what is it about a theme that really speaks to a young person. And I can't help but think that communication in history is gonna be one that speaks to a lot of students. Um, because we're learning at this moment, these different ways of communicating. Um, you know, earlier in the call, um, I wanna say it was Allison who was talking about how important it was during your research to maintain a constant communication with your teacher and how challenging that was in the spring. Um, so I, th I think that's true for so many of us right now. You know, we're learning different ways of communicating and maybe those experiences that we're having are gonna allow student projects this year to be that much more compelling because we really do understand the need for human communication and for that communication, you know, to be effective in order to convey the understanding that we need it to. Um, 
So again, I was just sort of brainstorming on one side and then I was thinking about, okay, so what kinds of materials do we have? Um, from diaries to letters to coded messages, we really do. We have really cool coded messages in the library's collection. If that's, you know, are any of you doing a project this year? Just raise your hand. Are you doing another History Day project? Oh yeah, love that. Um, yeah, there's this great message, um, you know, um, when Lewis and Clark were exploring the Western United States, Thomas Jefferson actually created a code um, language that they could use and communicate um, through letters. So if Lewis and Clark had anything secret they wanted to say, they could use the Jefferson code. And so we really do have letters in the Jefferson papers that are in code, which I just love. I think that's cool. Um, but of course, published works and music and telegrams and you name it. And Courtney, if you go to the next slide, these are the kinds of things you're gonna find. First of all, the Library of Congress holds the papers of Alexander Graham Bell. Um, that's, that in itself is amazing. The, the other amazing thing about those papers is that they've been transcribed. <laughs> so you can search them a little bit differently than you can a lot of manuscript collections. Um, the papers of Alexander Graham Bell include, as you can imagine, Alexander Graham Bell knew everybody and his correspondence files are extraordinary. Um, the letters between Bell and other scientists of the time, again, definitely worth exploring. If you search on Bell, if you search on Telegram, if you search on Telegraph, if you search on any of those terms, you'll find images, you'll find materials that, that might take you in a totally different direction in terms of your research. Um, Courtney, how about the next one? Um, for and this is, you know, when you're exploring, this is the fun part about search engines. So you're on the library's website, you're thinking about communication, and you start thinking about communicative words. And this is what I did. I started searching on words like shout and yell and whisper and other communication words just to see what I'd get. And then I narrowed my search to just notated music because I thought, well, this is weird and who knows what I'll find. And sure enough, the, you know, the library holds some insane number of pieces of sheet music. And that's, you know, back to what you were talking about earlier. Um, I think it was summer, you were talking about the look in Life magazines and how, how fun it was to get a glimpse of popular culture. Well, sheet music does that kind of thing for an earlier time period. Um, so again, I was just being silly and of course came up with a ton of stuff. Um, Courtney, how about the next one? Um, and I'm really, it was great looking at all of your documentaries and seeing how you incorporated newspapers. And I suspect all of you are familiar with Chronicling America. And if you're not, you need to be. Um, Chronicling America features about 17 million newspapers and they are fully text searchable. So when your search results come up, the word that you searched on is actually highlighted in the newspaper, which is just sort of mind blowing for those of us who grew up, you know, a million years ago and had to use microfilm and it's just different. But Chronicling America is an amazing source. Um, and um, part of what I've got up on the page is not just the main Chronicling America site, but also the topics page. That topics page that you can get to from the main page is a wonderful place to just get some ideas as you're exploring possibilities for topics. And I know that lots of students find value in those topics pages. Okay, Courtney, next one. For those of you on the call who are classroom teachers, if you are not yet familiar with the library's teachers page, I invite you to do some exploring. Um, there are resources on our teachers page that range from our primary source sets to opportunities for professional development to additional resources, classroom materials that might be useful as you are getting your students to conduct their own original research and approaches to analyzing primary sources that can come in really handy when that research begins. And finally, if you get stumped, <laughs> They're on every single one of the Library of Congress pages. When you see these little lines on the very, very top right, if you click on those lines, one of the links is going to bring you to, go ahead, Courtney, to the Ask a Librarian site. And there really are real live librarians at the Library of Congress who are happy to help you conduct your research. 
They are not going to do your research for you, but they will absolutely help you, help guide you into some collections and to some resources. And really, they're great at posing the questions that sometimes you really need someone to ask as you're getting started in your research to get you on the right path. So I hope that you will all take advantage of the library's collections and really remember that the Library of Congress is our nation's library and it belongs to all of us and we should all be taking great advantage of it. So good luck to all of you. And I think Lynn, there's a little time left. Absolutely, thank you so much, Liam. I yeah. wanna end with one quick question. I call this a 10 second question because I just want a quick answer. My, and I'm actually gonna ask everybody this question. What is the one thing that your teacher taught you last year that you now would just would tell another teacher, like students, if they know this, it can help them so much. Maybe what's the best piece of advice, the best tip, or the best suggestion? So let's see here. Um, Caroline, what's the best piece of advice your teacher gave you last year? Um, she told me how to organize research, and that was really important. Absolutely. You can find a lot, but if you can't keep track of it, it kind of just disappears. Rishi, what's the best thing your teacher taught you last year? Uh, how to take criticisms from other people and turn that into a better project overall. Absolutely. It's hard to listen to feedback on things that we've written or things that we've created, but it makes it so much better when we can. Allison, what would you say? Oh, looks like Allison just got booted off. Sophia, what would you say? What's the best piece of advice your teacher gave you? Um, I'd say don't be able, don't be like afraid to change like everything. Like if you go like, just go with your gut. Like if you think one thing will be better, if you like take something out, then just take it out and see how it looks. Absolutely. And your projects can change, right? They change and evolve over time. And sometimes the thing that you thought had to be in there in the end, you're like, yeah, that could go. And it's actually better without it. Summer, what would you say the best piece of advice from your teacher was? I would say that the best advice was to show my finished documentary to someone who's never seen it before or never heard of this topic before to see if it's too dense or if I'm speaking too fast or too slow. And also to restate my thesis several times throughout the documentary to drive home that point. Okay, I think that's really important because sometimes I think when we're involved in a project, we get a little too involved in a project and we can't see that there's a problem or an issue. Um, and I think showing it to people who don't know you is even better because let's be honest, mom or grandma tends to say really good things about it, right? But if you can show it to somebody who doesn't know you, you're going to get even better feedback then. And Juliana, what's the best piece of advice that came from your teacher last year? Uh, the best advice that I got was to tie um, like any major event or anything that happens in your documentary, like drive home, how it ties back to your theme. Absolutely. Using that theme to help organize and drive your argument. Well, this has been really exciting. I want to say thank you and congratulations to the students who are the winners of the 2020 Next Generation Angels Awards. We cannot wait to see your projects for NHD 2021 for this year's theme of communication and history, the key to understanding. In closing, thank you very much to Ken Burns and the Better Angel Society, as well as George Taroni, Leanne Potter, and the team from the Library of Congress for their partnership in making this program possible. For more information about National History Day, please visit nhd.org and be on the lookout in the few, next few days for a link with access to this program and additional resources. I know we couldn't get to all of the teacher questions in the queue, but we're going to work to respond to you either directly as a group to make sure that you get answers because there were so many good questions in there. We hope to see you again tomorrow. We'll be live at 12.30 p.m. Eastern Time for the second annual Student History Documentary Film Festival. Uh, we'll be screening these students' films in their entirety, and the winners will take questions from students who are going to join from all over the country and around the world. If you haven't watched them, go ahead to nhd.org slash 2020 next generation angels you can register your class to join us tomorrow thank you so much for joining us and please enjoy the rest of your evening or the rest of your day this concludes our program this evening thank you everyone and have a wonderful night